thank you all for having me here, and thanks to Angie and TJ for accepting my talk presentation. Um, as we mentioned here, I'm in IBL in calculus number three in abstract algebra. And if you read the abstract for this talk, I am an amateur IBLer. I haven't been doing this for a very long time, or at least I haven't been calling it IBL for a very long time. Maybe that's the right way of saying it. So we're going to go through these four parts. Um, so first, I want to let you know where I'm at as far as IBL is concerned. Where's my IBL history? And then I've got three main categories that I want to share with you. And so the first category I'm looking at is perspective. And this is about student perspective. Not my perspective, but their perspective of me in the class and mathematics. And the other thing is student pride. And then the last thing is crowd control. <laughs> Sometimes it's very helpful to have a way of controlling them if they get out of control, or if they're the type to trend out of control, it's nice to have a way of pulling them back in. All right, so my IBL history. I was interested or introduced to IBL in 2009 because I was part of Project Next, and one of the things that Project Next tends to do is try to expose new people who are interested in teaching to lots of different teaching things, and one of those was discovery learning and that's how I had it in my head that, hey, there's this thing called IBL. In 2013, I attended the IBL workshop in um, San Luis Obispo. And after that, I developed course notes for number theory and abstract algebra. I got a small grant from the AIBL. So I really strongly encourage you guys to all consider doing something like that. And that helped me develop the course notes for abstract algebra. Um, by develop, that shouldn't be past tense, because I developed them, yes, but they're certainly not done, because there's always revisions that have to happen. Um, and that's the next thought. I'm revising those course notes still. And I also applied the IBL attitude to my calculus group, and so that's differential calculus and um, integral calculus, so Calc 1 and Calc 2. And that happened more as a whim. Like right before the semester was getting ready to start, I thought, you know, if I can do this with my majors, I should be able to do something with calculus. And so I emailed them, and so before they even met me, I was giving them homework, saying, hey, before you come to class, I'd like you to have these things done. And as this mentioned, this is calculus, number theory, and abstract algebra. Calculus 1 had 20 students in it. Um, calculus 2 is pretty much majors only, and so the other majors at Clark don't require calculus 2, like none of them. And so we jumped from 20 to 6. Um, number theory and abstract algebra each had around 10. So number theory had 12 and abstract algebra had 11. Um, we have our classes rigged so that our sophomores and our juniors are together. So the small group gets put together to be a slightly bigger group, but Clark is a small Catholic liberal arts institution, and so we have to rig our classes to keep enrollment up. And so we have sophomores and juniors working together in number theory and abstract algebra, and then all across the spectrum for gen ed stuff for Calc 1 and then majors only in Calc 2. Both of them had presentations. Uh, the calculus sequence had homework from their book. And in case you are curious, this is the book that they were using. It's a Hughes Hallett sixth edition book. Um, and they also made their own mock exams. So like they would give me questions that they thought would be a reasonable exam question for each section and they get some sort of bonus points for doing it. Uh, number theory and abstract algebra, they did presentations, and they also were working off of the course notes that I mentioned earlier. And they had to type up that portfolio using tech. And I'll talk about some resources I used for that when we get there. So that's generally where I'm standing IBL-wise. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is perspective. So this is student perspective. And we all know that we want our students to enjoy mathematics, right? They should already. So math should be fun. And if you think about how people learn, often there's like some sort of information dissemination. I'm going to tell you a bunch of stuff, and then I'm going to ask you to do something informally, and maybe it'll be formal. There's going to be some sort of exams, and hopefully you're going to stop and reflect and say, what did I learn from this whole other thing? And I thought it would be more fun if I gave them new names. So when I'm going to disseminate information, I give them a signpost. So here's the signpost. It's got some information you're going to need to do this exploration. And your explorations will help you when you do a quest. And after you've done your explorations and quests, we're going to have an in-class expedition. And after that, you're going to reflect 
on what happened. And so they make these reflections to think about what was going on. And so this is just kind of attitude and perspective that this should be a fun thing. This is an adventure. This isn't homework I have to do. This is an adventure. We should have fun doing it. That's my perspective. Hopefully they got it too. Most of them did. So this is a signpost that actually has some stuff in it. Um, I convinced Tech to do this for me, and the signposts are numbered so that we can refer back to them. So this is information from signpost two. This is information from signpost 10. So you can see each signpost starts saying signpost whatever, and ends saying end signpost whatever. So sometimes they get split over pages. Sometimes they don't. It just depends on the formatting. Um, the stuff in the middle is what I put on the top of all of the in-class expeditions. Usually it's just one big paragraph, but it's the mindset I want them to have. So this in-class expedition is intended to test you on some of the skills and the knowledge that you ought to have by now. Right, hopefully you have them. It's also intended to test you on a certain level, level of ingenuity. As with any expedition, you may encounter crazy, though non-life-threatening, situations which you have not seen before. They all know that they're going to see something new on the exam. Um, hopefully your persevering attitude will allow you to conquer whatever situations arise in this in-class expedition. There is one side to this document. You can do it. Right? Don't give up. I know this is new. I'm acknowledging it's new. Try it. Right? And they all know in advance that this is, they're going to get something new. And, and there's also old stuff, but there's some new stuff as well. So that's expeditions and signposts. Um, and after the expedition, they can either do this in class or they can email it to me. There's an expedition reflection. You know, what can you brag about knowing? Like, I was really glad that you had a computation problem because I am really good at computing things. Um, or I was really glad that you had something with modular arithmetic because I really love that I can do this. You know, where did you shine? Um, is there something that you knew really well but didn't get a chance to demonstrate? Right? Maybe I asked you something, because I mean, we've covered a lot of things, or we've talked about a lot of things, but maybe something showed up that you weren't expecting, or maybe you didn't get, something didn't show up you were hoping for. Like, I really wish you'd done functions, but I didn't get that up there. And did this expedition raise any questions that you would like to further pursue? Can you think of a conjecture? Anything surprise you? You had something new on it. Where do you think we might go? And so this is a reflection. Stop and think. And you can email this to me, or we can do it in class, depending on how much time you have. Um, I didn't want this to take away from the time that they were spending in class, and that's why I started the feel free to email it to me later. In their portfolios, so this would be for the abstract algebra number theory group, um, at the end of each section of problems, they would do this reflection as well. And so look back and reflect on what has happened thus far. What are you learning? What do you noticed? Why didn't we just say odd? Right? Do you think I had a motivation for that? Um, why was the phrase need not divide used here? And then did this make you think of any questions? And so interspersed throughout all of the course notes are these kind of reflection things like stop and think. Are you actually learning this way? What are you learning? Can you think of any questions that you want to talk about later? And so that's the things that show up in my portfolios. Um, I didn't put it in here, but I also have some context things. Like, I have some questions that show up as an exploration that say, what's an REU? And can you find an REU that has to do with abstract algebra or number theory? Or can you find a mathematician who's still alive? Right? You can't pick anyone at Clark because you already know us, but can you give me existence of some other mathematician who's still alive? Because they should know that we're here, right? <laughs> but when you look at most of the books, they're like, OK, you know, I've got this picture of this dead guy. Yay. You know, here this was done 100 years ago. Yay. You should know that there are people who are mathematicians and they're still alive and they're still working and mathematics is still going on. And so there's some context ex ex explorations in there too. If you've ever noticed when you're reading something, there's not any room to write. Or if there is room to write, it's only on the wrong side of the page if you're right-handed or on the right side of the page if you're left-handed. Right? So left-handed people really, really win on that one. Right, you open the cover, here's this room to write, I can read it over here. If you're right-handed, you can't write and read at the same time because there's just no room. So that's where stapling comes in. And so usually I pick it up, it's blank on this side, there's writing on that side, so obviously this is the front. But if you look at it, this is the end. The other side is the front. If I open it, 
there's room to write, or no, there's room to read on this side, which is the left side, the right hand I don't use, and there's room to write on this side, which is the right hand side that I use because I'm right-handed. And so for my right-handed students, I always staple things this way, and those are the settings that you have to use to get them stapled this way. So that you can draw arrows, you can make comments with your right hand, and point back to something over on this side. And it's an invitation, like this is in the perspective section, because this is my invitation for you to write something. You are expected to write and scribble and doodle and draw arrows. And if you're right-handed, you should have the space to do it on the right side. And so if you go to your advanced printer settings, make your pages go in reverse order, two staples on the right side, print it one-sided, and then you'll get it like this. So I have a few things printed out this way. If you wanted to try writing on them backwards later, you can do that. It's pretty handy. But it's that perspective. I'm inviting you to engage with the material with what I've given. Homework bookmarks. So perspective, again, this is me telling my calculus class that, hey, you may not know what I'm doing, but I know what I'm doing. And I had a plan that you get to keep in your book. So this is a homework bookmark. It is really a bookmark. And on it are a bunch of questions. So I have like homework 10, do these problems. Homework 12, do these problems. And on it, we also have the predicted discussion date. You know, you have to have the word predicted in there just in case. But this class actually did fairly well at staying with it. And so they know when they're expected to be ready to do it. They know that I've got a plan. And that perspective is amazing. Like, if they think that I know what I'm doing, then they have confidence that maybe I really do know what I'm doing. You know? And they're willing to try it. And so this is for the Calc 1 group. That's like all across the board. And so some of them are math majors and they're willing to go along with me. And some of them are like, I'm in here so that I get my psych BS instead of my psych BA. And I'm really afraid and I'm a senior and I put it off as long as I can to take my BS instead of my BA in calculus. And they're paranoid and terrified. And it's like, no, I got a plan. Trust me, we'll be good. You got a bookmark, you know exactly where we're going, what day, it's in your book if you lose it. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if you can see, but this is scribbled all over because it's also scratch paper. And so homework bookmarks are really wonderful. One of my colleagues at Clark introduced me to the idea. And so then I can say, you know, pull out your homework bookmark, you know where we're at. And if you lose it, it's up on Moodle so you can print a new one. Moodle's our um, LMS, our learning management system that we use at Clark. Pride, right? I'm a mom. I have a three and a half year old. He'll be four, actually, it's more than three and a half. He'll be four in a month. And I have a one and a half year old who will be two in September. And they teach me a lot about pride. Uh, my students realize so much based off of what my children have taught me. I never thought that being a mom would make me a better teacher, but it's amazing. So pride, word choice. Good luck. If I write down good luck on your exam, you know, here's the stuff, here are my instructions, good luck. When I'm writing it, I'm saying, good luck, you can do this, this is awesome. Okay, now remember, these are the students who are terrified of calculus. They come in and they see me say good luck, and it's not me saying it, they don't see me smiling, saying, yeah, this is great. They see good luck and they think, good luck. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna need a lot of luck on this exam, and it's, that's not the message I want. I want them to be bolstered to actually try it. And so take good luck, throw it away, and say, you can do it. It's the same theme that you want it to express, but it actually, I'm pretty sure you can't misinterpret that one. Right? I mean, I'm, maybe somebody can. But most people will say, you can do it, really means you can do it. Good luck could be either way. Next one, do you need help? Like this one is really straight from my toddler. Do you need help means that you really need help, and there is no way you're going to do this without me. Really, you need help. Throw that one out. Would you like help? There's a chance you could do this on your own. Maybe it's a good chance. You're in control. You can say whether or not you would like me to help you. If I'm looking at you, I know that there's no way that you're tall enough to reach the thing that's over the fridge. But if I say, would you like help, versus do you need help, it's a whole perspective 
switch, and it allows them to save pride. And so whenever you're asking someone if they would like help on their work, or if they'd like help on their problems, it's different, would you like help, versus do you need help? And so that's a perspective switch in pride. Um, this one isn't exactly pride, but it's another you know, word sw choice switch. Um, I got this from somebody in the education department at Clark. Does anyone have any questions? Right, we've all asked that. Does anybody have any questions? Here's this stuff. Does anyone have any questions? That is asking whether or not questions exist. It's possible no one has questions. Great. I know one of you has a question. What questions do you have? Because I'm pretty sure you can think of one. And so if you just change that word choice, then you might get new results. Proud problems, okay. So back to calculus. Every day they turn in five questions. Um, they do their five questions based off of their homework bookmark, have them ready to discuss at the beginning of the day. Um, we talk about them, and every day they get them back, all this stuff, and they just, you know, in one ear, out the other, it's gone. I don't want it to be gone. I want it to stay in their head. So every Friday, they turn in four proud problems. And I really call them proud problems because they are problems of which they should be proud. They look over their homework from the last week, they pick four, do them absolutely correctly, turn them in, and maybe even give me stories. Like, I am proud of this problem because I presented it to the class. I am proud of this problem because I didn't have to ask my neighbor to help me. You know, they give me stories about why they're proud as well. And it makes them look through all of their homework a second time. And then exam questions. I mentioned that the calculus group had mock exams that they wrote. Um, for bonus points, um, on Friday when they're turning their proud problems, they're also allowed to turn in one exam question from each section that we've covered in the last week. And I pick some of those to actually be on the exam. And so on exam day, they can look at the exam and say, that's my question. And they don't really you know, say it to their, the whole room, but they say it to their neighbors after the exam, like, that was mine. Did you see that my bear question made it on the exam? I'm like, how did you get a bear question in calculus? But they did it, they did, the, there was a bear doing something, it was running, there was a running bear, we needed to know its speed. Um, but it showed up on the exam. And so she was so proud that her question made it up on the exam, and she's not even a math major. I was like, yeah, I want all of them. But because everybody wanted extra credit, everybody gave me questions, and so we had like 20 questions per section. Here, have a mock exam. And then they asked me to give them solutions to the mock exam. I was like, oh, now I have to type up solutions to all 20 questions. Tech. In Calc 2, Abstract Algebra, and Number Theory, they had to use tech. Um, I started in Number Theory, and they used Rightly Tech, which I learned of by Dana Erst when I was at the IBL workshop. Um, I've since learned of other ones. There's like Sage Cloud and Share Tech. Is that right there? But I like Write Tech, it's free, and you can share work with each other. Um, they can send me links that are like read and edit or just read, and so we've got collaboration. So I can give them a template just to get them started and then they can work. So this started in number theory, and in number theory, they were working and they did a presentation that had to do anything to do with the class that we've been doing. And one of my students did a presentation on why she was so glad that I forced her to learn tech. Hated it at the beginning, oh my goodness, you're teaching me tech, I don't know when I'm ever gonna use this, why do I need to learn it? End of the semester, I am so glad we had to learn tech. I am so glad that you should teach the calculus students how to use tech before they get to this site. And so Calc 2 came and I said, hey Calc 2 people, guess what? You're gonna learn tech. And so my Calc 2 people did uh, papers in tech, so at the end, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this book, but at the end of every chapter they have like special problems and so the Calc 2 people had to pick um, special problems at the end of each chapter and then write up a little paper in tech based off of our mathematics communication rubric that our department has. Using tech made them feel professional, which goes back to the pride thing, right? I can write a paper in Word, type it up. It looks like the same paper as I've been writing in high school. Great. 
wow, I put it in tech. It looks like the same paper that they have in that journal and it looks like the same paper that it has over here and it's the same format that's in my book. And Wow, I'm a professional. So there's that pride. Colored pens, so Dana showed up again. Um, have you ever read the Math Ed Matters blog? And so he has one blog on give students a colored pen. Um, I was introduced to this at the IBL workshop. So the students in calculus do their five problems. They bring them with them to class. I run around the class, because there are only 20 of them. It doesn't take too long. I look at their work, and I give them a number. You know, we had five problems. You attempted all five. You get a five out of five. You had five problems, you attempted three of the five, you get a three out of five. Just check in to see how much they tried. And then everybody puts their pencils away. I pull out my big bag and they draw pens. And all of the class discussion happens with them with a pen in their hand. All of their notes are in pen that's a different color than they used on their homework. And so I can see what they did in class versus what they did before they got to class. And I can see the messages that they leave me on the homework, because they do leave me lots of messages, because they know that I read them. And I have stuff that, before they get to class, they write it down, and they say, I am so lost on this problem. And then in pen, it's scribbled out, and it says, I get it. And it's like, wow. If we hadn't had that in-class discussion, I wouldn't get that. And I get so many fun comments from pen. But you should definitely try it. Um, the structure, they bring it to class, they turn it in for that completely spree grade, annotate it, and then depending on how they're doing with the proud problems, sometimes I need that extra reinforcement to stop and really digest the material. And so you can do it two different ways. You can collect it at the end of the period, and then they get a bonus point for annotating it. Or you could say that you have to hold on to it and bring it to me next time, and I want every single problem complete and correct and then they turn that in the next time. Grading stuff that's already been graded by them is fast. It is pretty much complete and correct because they've already talked about it with their classmates. And so I just have to look and say, yeah, you're good. And very rarely do I have to change something. I'm only, mainly fixing like notation, like this symbol really belongs over here, and that doesn't take very long. So if you haven't tried it yet, I definitely recommend the, the colored pen thing. Okay, crowd control. This is the time for you guys to do the IBL thing. Um, I'm pretty sure I can convince you to have a conversation that's kind of out of control. What I want you to do is talk, like I'll, I'll give you just a few minutes, I'm gonna describe it first, and then you can go. What you're gonna do is talk loud enough so that if I'm talking without a microphone, Stan can't hear me, right? So this is your prompt. Actually, I have a few things, but I think that you can do it on your own. So these are, um, quotes from my students, I asked them for advice for next semester's Calculus 1 group. So now that they've finished Calc 1, what's your advice for next semester? And so I'm thinking that you can take these and say, I remember this story. Right, I'm pretty sure that you've all seen comments that are pretty similar to these. And so I'm just gonna spread them out. And take them, share them, read them, jog your memory, don't even read them, start a story. Talk to your neighbors, I'm just looking for some sort of boisterous conversation. Do you want one? Oh. Oh, let me grab one of them. Yeah. And feel free to go talk to someone. Make noise. I didn't yell, ever. I didn't use the microphone, and yet somehow I got all of you to listen to me. Um, if you can hear my voice, clap your hands once. Usually you get at least one other person. I did get exactly one other person. If you can hear my voice, clap your hands twice. I got about five more people. Three times I had most of you, four times everybody was it. Um, you guys are actually the first time I made it to four. Usually I only make it to three. <laughs> um, I have one more thing, but I have been told that I'm out of time. So I'll just make it really quick. If you have a conversation that you want to keep in an organized fashion, you need to have something that works. And so as a presenter, I get to be in control of the tossable toy. And then I can say, okay, now, Victor, give me a comment. Oh, you missed it. You know, toss it in the general direction, but brand now. <laughs> Bert now gets to tell me a comment because he's the one who caught the toy. Although he doesn't have the microphone, so he doesn't, I don't know if we get to comment. Right. And so it's a good way to keep the conversation organized. 
And it also is fun because you notice you all laughed as soon as Victor missed it and Bert picked it up. But that's everything. I just wanted to thank you all again. And that's it. Please thank our speaker. I'm Jonas Meyer at Loras College in Dubuque, Iowa. I was just curious about the new stuff on exams. Like, what do you mean by new? Just a, a specific problem they haven't seen before or a whole new concept? Both. Um, so for instance, let's see if I can pull it up. I don't know if I have it on here. So this is the final. So in abstract algebra, they had they know about things like additive identities, all of that stuff. But they don't know things about vector calculus and vector addition and scalar multiplication. And so if I take R3 and I put it together with addition and cross multiplication, all of a sudden, hey, does this form a ring? Does this do that? What happened? What's my additive? Is this an additive identity? Is that a multiplicative identity? And so I'm taking the identity stuff and the ring structure stuff in a new ring that actually ties it together to Calc 3, which everybody in the class was taking at the same time. But they had seen before questions in which they were given a structure and tried they to see if it was a They were given structures, like, just not that structure. but not this structure. And Thank they've you. never had to do um, cross-multiplication for me before. It's Kat Schultes. Um, so when you have them turn in the proud problems once a week, are those problems that they've already turned in and gotten feedback on, or, mm -hmm. okay. So every day they turn in homework. And every day I turn it back, which, by the way, helps with me procrastinating because I can't procrastinate with them. Every day I have to give them something. And I get to give them feedback on it. And usually I like, put smiley faces next to the stuff that say, like, I feel smart. It's like, oh, good, he gets a smiley face. Or like, this is still hard, and it's like, come see me. And so they've already gotten feedback on the problems. I'm Anders Hendrickson from St. Norbert College. Um, <laughs> regarding the LaTeX, um, you're one of the, f one of the, f one of the first um, speakers I've heard talking about using that at the level of Calc 2. And it sounds like you're having them do that for just once, just a kind of a one page paper or something at the end of a chapter? Pretty much, yeah. Based on your experience then with those students and that, what, would you, what are your thoughts about encouraging them to do that more often? Is it too much work for them to be typing their proud problems in that, or? They could probably do it. Um, I did it actually twice. They had two papers that they had to give me, and they were generally a page and a half to four pages. Um, and it was hard for them to balance the, I have to write a paper in mathematics, which they never had to do before, with, oh, and now I'm learning something new at the same time. And so there was a lot wrapped in on it. I haven't considered making them tech the proud problems, but it would definitely save me time if they teched like, their exam questions that they're turning in. And teaching them tech also helps it when we're communicating via email. I can, instead of pulling out my iPad and scribbling on it, which I can do and email them, I can just put some tech code in the email back and say, here, and they'll be able to understand it. But it's a good idea to use proud problems, too. I hadn't thought of it. And let us, let us thank our speaker one last time, please. Yeah.